Hey guys, so this is the second video in the series on narcissists and narcissism <laughs> and how to deal with it, how to cope, how to um, recoup, find yourself again, how to recollect at the end after, after going through all that you've been through, all that you've gone through, how do you regroup your soul? So first we have to understand like what happened to your soul during the time with the narcissist, what happened? Um, to understand that, we have to understand what happens to a narcissist, what creates a narcissist. So I drew three cards from the Tarot of Shadows deck, which I find absolutely um, amazing. In And that was the intent behind this deck, was to dive into the shadow aspects, into the darker aspects of human existence, and to get to know the energies there that drive the human soul right so the three cards that came up i find were really 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 well explanatory and i'll go through each one so we start off with um the nine of swords okay and the nine of swords here is um it's assigned to the planet mars and it's also attributed to the chinese um, year of the snake so that's interesting because if we remove all the the meanings and we just stick with the images it already explains everything mars and snake right so here we go and it's called swagger and we see this woman standing in front of a mirror now the meaning and i'll read out loud the meaning to you these cards are stunningly beautiful i'll read out loud the meaning to you and one second let me just grab the book here and swagger is is excessive pride right so narcissism that's why it's called narcissism has to do with excessive pride and except how this person sees themselves and that they're desiring that the outer world sees them exactly the way that they want to be seen this is not actually how they see themselves on the inside but how they want to be seen and perceived on the outside which is why their outer image is so important to them and they are surrounding themselves with people that reflect that image back to them that they want to see and if these people don't reflect that image back to them then what happens is that they become manipulated so in the beginning it's the love bombing phase but by the end of it it's it's the do or die phase and um, quite literally in some cases so swagger is recognized as the mode of behavior whereby one extols one's worth and superiority to an undue degree Arrogant people hold themselves superior and are conceitful, domineering, and disdainful. The causes that trigger swagger vary. In some occasions, it is based on claims of intellect, education, athleticism, or physical experience. appearance. In other, it is founded on wealth, rank, lineage, or power. Nevertheless, it can just as easily be based on illusion or rooted in the past. The four stages that characterize the generation and development of swagger can be broadly defined as follows. Stage one. This is just a period of self-enhancement. There is nothing manifestly extravagant in this person's behavior. Stage two. The person begins to believe in his or own, her own superiority. The first signs of swagger emerge. For example, a tendency to interrupt a conversation, to express an opinion, or hearing only what coincides with one's own views. Stage three, self-confidence has become selfishness expressed in the infringement of other people's boundaries. The person's behavior is driven by his or her ego and is characterized by arrogance and indifference to other people's emotions. And stage four, in this last step, conscience is of no consequence. Self-criticism is completely absent. And such a person can quickly become intolerable. This is the moment when hard truth sets in. The arrogant individual realizes that swagger is not a virtue, but merely a desperate way to escape insecurity, achieve recognition, or find a place among fellow humans. The card meaning is self-affirmation, coldness, conceit, proud contempt of others, anger, hatred, haughtiness, pugnaciousness, anxiety, presaging unpleasant events, loneliness, failed expectations, repulsion as a result of loneliness. So this card is really describing the interior world and the development of a narcissist. So it usually starts off really small. But something wounded their sense of self, they wounded their sense of, of who they are, wounded their ego 
so that they develop into this overcompensating over this need to overcompensate and um, over exaggerate their positive image of themselves that they want to desperately have and they want to desperately have people reinforce that for them this is excessive pride this is pride to the hilt and completely believing in the reality of an, ex an exterior image an exterior expression of being which is why in my initial video i said this is a spiritual problem because foundationally we have to realize that we are spiritual beings and that everything that is on the outside no matter how wonderful <laughs> it's all plato it's your art it's your it's 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 an expression but it's not who you actually truly are but these people identify themselves with their expression and that's why they need others to validate that validate their expression validate who they want to be perceived as swagger the second card that came up and i'll tie it all together here right after we go through the three cards is card number 70 and this is the nine of pentacles and this is assigned to Theoph theophilus and his renunciation for those of you that have never heard the bible sto um, the story the church story of theophilus and his renunciation let me just reiterate that for you um, the story of theophilus of cilicia has significant position in biblical history since it is the oldest account of a deal between a human and the devil theophilus held a senior clergy position in the city of adana and cilicia this is in Turkey. After the death of the bishop, he was unanimously elected in his position, but out of humility, he refused the episcopal seat. When the new bishop cruelly deprived him of all his honors, Theophilus decided to enter into a deal with the devil to regain what he was deprived of. Through the help of a necromancer, he passed on a message to Satan, who demanded that Theophilus should denounce Jesus and the Holy Mother in exchange for his help. Theophilus agreed, and he was restored to his previous position. Not long after, however, Theophilus reproached himself for what he had done. For many days and nights he fastened, asking the Lord for forgiveness. Finally, the Lord sent the Holy Mother to grant Theophilus absolution. However, Satan did not wish to relinquish his hold over the cleric. He only did so after Christ's intervention, who took the contract away from Satan and placed it on Theophilus's chest. When the latter woke up and saw the damning paper, he confessed openly his sin, and for the rest of his days he remained an example of righteousness. So the card meaning is unwise decisions, dependency, rash decisions, foolish actions, dangerous deals, suffering the consequences, an unsettled mind, a guilty conscience, ambivalence, torment, repentance, and renunciation. So this card is indicating the bridge to healing for this narcissist, the bridge to healing, but also for the sufferers of narcissism, right? This is interesting because the sufferers of narcissism have to go through the exact same process as the narcissist themselves, because we have to understand that this expression of the narcissist is the other side, the suppressed side of the sufferer. Okay. Now this is, this is going to get into it because we're used to like seeing ourselves as pure victims, but we have to understand that this is talking about a deal with the devil right and a deal with the devil is always voluntary the devil has in church lore has no power over those that are not voluntarily going over to him this is why he has to trick and why he has to manipulate why he has to bribe why he has to lie because otherwise people won't go to him right so the deal that you have as an empath or as a codependent with a narcissist and i know this is tough right but this is part of what i had to do as well in order to release the grip that the narcissist had over me was to recognize that i had voluntarily put myself in that position now voluntarily has nothing to do with knowledge or ignorance right that is a whole other ball game because obviously if we we're completely in the know we wouldn't be putting ourselves in the lion's mouth right so obviously we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into however we did so voluntarily right and this is a really crucial crucial aspect of and part of the healing that needs to be recognized that needs to be owned because that is a huge piece of power that you're going to develop and build up in yourself as time goes on that whatever it is that you do you are doing so voluntarily and you are claiming it you're affirming it and you are not allowing anybody else to say oh I convinced you or you allowed yourself to be convinced no you were already saying this is my choice 
and that will awaken that feeling of power over your life again within you right so theophilus and this is what both narcissist and empath narcissist and codependent narcissist and victim narcissist and have to go through is this repentance stage this recognition and repentance stage exorcists um, will also talk about this voluntary deal with the devil that people go into and that most people that are being exercised they have gone into this deal voluntarily now this can come through excessive grief excessive loss excessive trauma to the soul and my grandmother used to say the same experience and this is why we can't judge the same experience will turn one man one way and the, another man another way right so trauma and childhood can turn you into a narcissist it can also turn you into an empath right it all depends it depends on many different factors but not least and not less and not all the way at the back your own decision who it is that you decide you're going to be who it is that you decides you're going to express yourself as what star you're deciding to follow right so Theophilus he went in and he made a deal with the devil to receive again what he had lost receive again what he had lost so it's kind of like after we step out of this relationship with a narcissist this is the most dangerous period, the most dangerous time where we also decide how we're going to move forward with the healing, right? So we can go into a deal with the devil and um, try to get revenge and through revenge, hope to get that soul peace back that we lost, try to get back what we lost, lost time, reclaim our time, <laughs> reclaim lost time, reclaim time, whatever it is that we're trying to reclaim energy. Um, but the best and the most efficient way to get through this time for the narcissist and for the victim is to repent and to say, okay, I see now um, why I did what I did. I see what was um, behind, what was truly my motivating factor. And now we have to admit for some of us, I'll admit it for myself, is that oftentimes we, we come out of abusive childhoods or abusive situations and we come out confused. We have no idea what's up in life, what's wrong in life or the right decisions to make for ourselves, right? What's the right decision for me to move ahead in my life? And it's kind of subliminally trained, especially into women, to follow the lead of their man, right? Men that drive cars, that drive them so well. This is classic symbology. Your subconscious understands the symbology very well, and it'll regurgitate it in dreams. And driving a car in a dream has to do with being in control with your own life. Who's sitting behind the wheel of the car is the person that is determining your life more times than not. So if we're always picturing, oh, I got a guy, and this is just an example out of personal experience. Oh, I got a guy that drives well. I mean, that wasn't the only thing I was looking out for. Of course not, right? But um, I'm young, right? Super, super, super young. <laughs> this wasn't just yesterday. So um, you're, you're looking for someone to take over your life for you and this is what why a lot of people are codependent they go into codependencies because they're desiring someone to sit and and help them make the right choices in life help them to see things that they cannot see help them to become aware of what's good for them and what's wrong and hope that they'll lead them on a path to success and stability and whatever it is that's that's missing for you in your life However, the only way to, to make the right decisions for you is through experience, through self-knowledge, and through following your gut, right? And that takes risk. It takes courage. It takes courage, and courage cannot be taught, right? You can fall into courage. You can step out in courage. You can get so angry that you do things that would need courage, but it's not something that can be taught. And courage to live life on your own terms is something that you will have to reclaim for yourself. And this habit of allowing others to step in and take the lead and allowing others to give you permission to live and allowing others to, you know, talk to, into you or convince you this is the right way to go. This is the right thing to do that has to end. Right. And this is where we come in and we reclaim and we own the power that we have over our own lives. And we start trusting our gut. We start trusting the. Whew, the feelings that arise in us, that come up in us, that tell us go left but not right, say yes but no, say maybe and wait and hold off and now say no, say maybe and now say yes. And all these complicated decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis that have to do with how we run our lives. So it's um, 
really 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 important that you recognize what it is that brought you into this position and once you recognize that you can um, not necessarily beg for forgiveness understand that these old stories have to do with our psyche as well but it has to do with um, taking a step back and saying okay I made this decision I made this mistake um, I really see the value of the lesson that I've now learned and I'm now going to make different decisions I'm going to change my decisions because the decisions that I was making previously they weren't the right decisions for me I was making right decisions for other people and making them happy but I wasn't making me happy right my soul happy happy so um and feeling good is not a surface thing it's not when you make decisions in life and you're following your feelings and making decisions in life it's not about the surface momentary whoo that felt good <laughs> it's it's you feel it deep inside that this is the right flow this is the right current that you, that's carrying you forward you feel it deep inside because deep inside there are no resistances there's nothing like stopping and holding up right so the final card that's coming up is the ace of swords and the ace of swords in traditional tarot has to do with inspiration insight new beginnings new starts new ideas new decisions new ways in the decision making process right and um, it also has to do with discernment so here we have excalibur sword as the ace of swords 64 this card is assigned also to the planet of pluto which has to do with destruction and transformation but also mars with taking action right so this card by the way was uh venus and the first card was also mars so if we look mars venus mars pluto we're looking at action without real depth right there was no real depth behind it then um, a softening of the heart a softening of the the perspective and then we took action again but with depth with pluto backing it up so this goes deep right so deep foundational changes and transformation deep foundational insight inspiration and wisdom and um and this is is glorious right so the story let me read the um the card meaning one second guys of 64 the ace of swords um ba -bum. one second it is perhaps one of the most mysterious swords in history the sword in the stone the sword of the great king arthur most likely the origin of excalibur is celtic but it is also known by several other names such as um Kaledfish, or i can't even caliburnus caliburk and Kaleswal. legend has it that excalibur was forged in avalon by the legendary sorcerer merlin there are two contradictory versions about the way king arthur gained possession of excalibur um, one version would of course be that he pulled it from the stone and the second version was that he received it from the lady of the lake most interpretations of the Excalibur legend endow the sword with magical powers. It possessed cutting strength and durability beyond that of ordinary weapons, and its scabbard protected its bearer from physical harm. The first time Excalibur was drawn, Arthur's enemies were blinded by its blade, which was as bright as 30 torches. In many versions, Excalibur's blade bears engravings on both sides. On one side, we find the words, take me up, and on the other words, cast me away. And this portends its return into the water. But there are more than one accounts of how the sword finds its way back home. So one version has it stolen by the evil sorceress Morgan Le Fay. The other version is um, King Arthur, who returned it to the Lady of the Lake before his death. Then um, another version is that... The lady of the lake came and got it herself and so on and so forth so the card meaning is freedom determination courage noble ideas justice help from above pure thoughts and a heightened sense of responsibility so this is a maturation process a spiritual purification and maturation process and you can see how we deal with life immaturely here right where we use the world around us and use others as a mirror as a um as a reflection right and this is using using it's a very low spiritual level a low spiritual way of um dealing with the world dealing with what um, this world means right 
then we go through this purification, this renunciation, this recognizing, this realization process of what's actually going on and what we need to do and what we did and how we made a pact with the devil, right? So it's not just the ones that are narcissists that make a pact with the devil. Please understand this. It is also the other side, the victim that makes a pact with the devil. Now, the narcissist may be making a pact with the devil on an internal level, right? So through excessive grief, loss, alienation, loneliness, um, giving up, right? Giving up a faith and a belief in the life force energy, in positive life force. But the empath, the codependent, they make a pact with the devil within the narcissist, right? So they make a pact with them that you take care of me, you make the decisions for me, you um, stay with me and keep me from loneliness, right? You do all this for me, which is supposed to make me happy and I will love you forever, that kind of thing, right? And if they don't do it, then we try to say, look, look, look at this great pact and this great deal that we have going on. Why can't you honor it? Why don't you see it? <laughs> because they can't, right? And um, the outcome, though, once we've recognized and we've dissolved that pact with the devil, we've turned to our higher selves, we've allowed our higher selves to incarnate, we're saying, okay, I'm going to make different choices for myself in life. I'm going to allow my highest self to come in and to radiate down through me and fill in all these, these little pieces, fill in all these holes, these broken pieces, these missing pieces. I'm going to allow it to come in and radiate out through me. This is when Excalibur's sword is drawn, when the spirit of discernment is allowed to come in, right? When the spirit of realization is allowed to come in, when this um, maturation process has happened, when this spiritual evolving process has happened, and when out of the, the um, there's that saying through excessive pressure, a diamond is born. So that moment when the diamond is born, right? That moment when through excessive pressure, something very, very precious comes out. So in a nutshell, these cards are saying with three cards only and just um, applicable stories. That's interesting. And I'm sorry I pre-pulled, but those were the cards that really came up. Um, but they're saying that there is a reason why a narcissist is a narcissist, right? So we still have to encounter these people with compassion in spite of um, saying, okay, you know, as long as you're in this state of mind, in the frame of mind, a relationship with you, the way that we envision it with love, reciprocated love, won't be possible. But I still respect your journey. I respect your path. I, um, I have compassion for you. I feel for you. I hope one of these days you're able to release this pride that you're holding on to, that you're able to renounce it, that you're able to um, recognize and repent in a certain way way right and not repent in a way where you know you're coming and you're you're falling on your knees and you're begging for forgiveness and so on and so forth if that happens great but um, in a way where you can see this is what I need to do moving forward and um, this is what I need to align myself to these are the thoughts that I need to align myself to these are the thoughts that I need to um, um, attach myself to, see myself as, and see it in a positive way, in a positive light, then um, that's what we need to do, right? So that's what we need to do is find compassion for these people that are still suffering and allow them to move down their own pathway. Uh, for ourselves, however, it's imperative and important that we own take responsibility for our decisions of getting into a relationship with a narcissist for recognizing what is it that attracted us to them right what did we see that would benefit us in a relationship with this narcissist what were they were they super attractive were they super good in bed did they you know promise that they'd love us forever did they promise that they'd make the best decisions for us so we could just turn off and not take responsibilities for our life like what was it right and once we can face up to that, 
that is when the true jewel is born. That is when we come out on the other side, out of the dark, into the light once again. But things have shifted. We're making better decisions for ourselves. We're standing in our truth and in our strength. We're stronger, we're wiser, we're more discerning. And we filled in all the gaps, all the holes. Everything has been brought into balance. So it is not an easy process. No, I'm not going to lie. It's not an easy process because this is making the darkness conscious. And um, as C.G. Young said, right, and making those dark shadow aspects of yourself also conscious that find themselves, um, I wouldn't say necessarily reflected in the narcissist because um, that wouldn't be entirely true, but um, find themselves in some way engaging with the energies of the narcissist, right? So um, I hope that made sense to you. I hope you enjoyed that. And um, we'll stay tuned for part three and four maybe <laughs> take care have a great day you guys bye